Boom, we are back. Discovering Egypt yet again. Uh, picking up from where we left off. Uh, we are going to... Um, we're going to finish off all of these like discovery tour things uh, just because it was such a great game uh, such like a great experience of like learning and uh, the ability to uh, engage with new environments um, bringing to life you know boring textbook stuff in new ways so let's check this out boom here we go uh, first one from where we left off So if you're new to this game, basically uh, what you do is you just go to different sections and then you watch like a, um, almost like a museum style tour, but you get to like move around and stuff, so it's kind of cool, you know? It's a pretty unique experience. And as I was saying before, like I really think that the Ubisoft team should definitely uh, look into making more games like this, or at least like going back and like editing the, the old games to make make this feature available. This is pretty cool. And this is what it looks like. So we got four stations. Welcome to Na Natron is a colorless salt that was used by ancient Egyptians for food preservation, cleansing products, and glass making. It was also used in the mummification process. Hmm, that's cool. Mummified people. Yeah, salt's very important. During the ceremonial embalmment ritual, the priests pack the body in natron in order to remove all of the moisture. Once mm. the body was thoroughly desiccated, they could begin the wrapping. Oh, that's cool. So it's almost like uh, curing. Is it called curing meat? Like that you uh, you put it like once you've hunted something, you put in salt. Natron was mined in Wadi Natron. The main mining methods involved either cutting slices out of the lake bed when it was dry, or raking through mineral saturated water to gather the mineral salts during the floods. Hmm, okay, cool. So the salt comes from the salt ocean. I take it, that's pretty cool. Also good for flavoring. Both techniques are still used today, and inspired the team in their recreation of the mines located in the mountains northwest of Memphis. Nice. I actually saw the salt, uh, the salt mines in Peru before. Very similar. Okay, that was a, that was a short goodie. There we go. Next one. Learning can be fun. Change of pace. Ooh, that's a cool band. A change of pace. Wow. Here we go. Okay. Welcome fauna. to Fauna of Ancient Egypt. Oh, that's kind of cool. This is what it was like back in ancient Egypt time. With all these uh, grazing cattle. Both domesticated and wild animals were features in ancient Egyptian bas reliefs as early as the first dynasty. While the variety of wildlife served as a reliable food source, it also influenced both culture and mythology. Makes sense. You venerate things that you. Uh... You appreciate. Egypt's terrain allowed for a diverse range of animals, including panthers, rhinoceroses, elephants, and many variations of antelopes. Hmm, black panther, right there. Across the one billion mark. Wow, awesome. The Nile was home to many species of fish, along with hippopotami and crocodiles. Hmm. Makes sense. That panther thing's crazy. I mean, like, not the movie, 
Although that's pretty impressive that it crossed 1 billion. I'm just saying that the whole panther thing and this, like, would have never expected that. The wide variety of birds that populated the riverbanks, from raptors and waterfowl to songbirds, were all cataloged within Egyptian hieroglyphic signs. Encounters with reptiles and insects, such as cobras, scorpions, Ooh. and scarabs, influenced hieroglyphs and art. Yeah, see, like, like uh, nobody really thinks panther, that's what I'm saying. Like, you think reptiles, like alligator makes sense, hippo makes sense. Yeah. Although you never think that, like, um, Egypt had a lot of water areas before. Oh, look, it's a ram. It's crazy. It's a pretty cool game. It's like, what's it like to be here at this time? Oh, look, the pyramids. That's sick. Oh, a lion. While what? all animals had sacred meanings. Lions in particular represented power and royalty to ancient Egyptians. They were so prized by pharaohs that they were hunted to extinction within Egypt. What? That's cool. There were lions back here too? I oh, see, I didn't know that. The female lion's more, uh, more vicious. Flora of ancient Egypt. If you guys can see but there's like little uh little pro tips i should probably be reading those on the side little fun facts welcome to flora the climate and unique geography of the nile delta offered a wide variety of plant species many of these plants served as sustenance for ancient egyptians and as crops for trade the Nile's consistent seasons allowed Egypt to sustain itself for centuries. See, it's so fascinating. You think that, like, like all this stuff, like, like people, people like to think that you know the Egyptians were like alien based and whatever, and whatever. But when you see this, you're like, no, this is, this is probably what it was like. Possibly the most useful of the plants was the papyrus. This tall sedge plant grew nice in abundance paper. along the water's edge of the Nile. Commonly known for its use as paper, the ancient Egyptians found many other functions for it, including rope, sandals, and mats. Hmm. It's like hemp. The pyroform boats made from the plant are seen in paintings and reliefs, and were used in ritualistic ceremonies. Hemp is also a very great uh, resource, I guess, like this papyrus thing. But yeah, like... I don't think it was, mm, maybe ancient civilization, sure, like, history's older than you think, but I don't think aliens. That, that makes no sense. There were many types of trees along the River Nile, such as the date palm, carob, and tamarisk. Mm -hmm. The earliest fruit tree cultivated was the fig tree, followed by apple, pomegranate, and eventually olive trees during the era of the New Kingdom. Oh, that's so cool, so... Mango cultivation was the result of a late import from Asia during huh. the Middle Ages. That's so fascinating. The first thing was, Some uh, trees were associated with gods, dates. such as the Acacia with Horus. Yes, Acacia. The divinities Thoth and Seshat were depicted inscribing the reign of the king into a Persia tree. The sycamore was connected with the goddess Iset, Patron of the Ritual of Life. Yes, I'm glad they brought up acacias. So acacia, fun fact, is high in uh, dimethyltryptamine. We create it in our bodies uh, for uh, dreaming. It's also what directs consciousness. Uh, your ability to like become aware of what's going on. So like, uh, it's also a really, like, really intense psychoactive hallucinogen. So uh, acacia trees. Uh, being spread out throughout these regions that would that would explain why people believed in deities so heavily uh actually like a fun fact is uh where my where my dad grew up there was like a acacia tree in the schoolyard and everyone called it like the demonic tree so they're like 
they were like, oh no, like don't go near the tree because it'll make you possessed. And then when I went there, I was like, oh, what kind of tree is that? They're like, acacia. I'm like, oh, that, that explains it. Because like anyone who climbed the tree would drop down and like act like they were possessed. So, fun fact, acacias. Science is key to understanding. Okay. Hmm, this will be interesting. Hieroglyphs. So the longer ones, uh, we might skip through if they're boring. You know. Don't wanna, don't wanna put you guys to too much sleep. But the learning of this is pretty cool. So like. You know, take what you can get. Okay, here we go. Siwa. Welcome to Ancient Egyptian Hieroglyphs. Sick. Hieroglyphics were used as sacred writing, appearing on monuments, statues, and sacred papyrus texts. The earliest symbols that resemble hieroglyphs were on pottery dating back to 4000 BCE. Hmm. This stylized form of signs and drawings was the only writing used from its ancient origins to the end of pharaonic history. Ancient Egyptians referred to hieroglyphs as the writing of the gods. That's cool. Uh, fascinatingly enough, um, if you actually look at the way we text now, that's in like modern hieroglyphs. Like you can put like an emoji just like uh, these things, you can just think of those things as like emojis and they convey so much meaning, you know, but it's within the context of understanding that you'll get what, what they're talking about. So like, we don't really know what each one means, but like, if you put like sad face, sad face, sad face, it means something more than like one sad face. You know what I mean? Context. Considered a difficult language, it was intended for pharaohs, nobility, and priests, and meant to be used in ceremonies within tombs and for government records. Mm, that's cool. Since few Egyptians were able to read the ancient hieroglyphs, the mythological aura around the language was persistent, even in their own culture. Mm, what you don't know. The you structure of hieroglyphs special. offers insight into Egyptian culture, not just in what the translations say, but in the structure of the symbols themselves. They were found on tomb walls, on sarcophagi, on statues and on pottery and were meticulously recorded in countless ancient papyri. Hmm, cool. In many temples, priests would perform rituals and daily offerings. These were accompanied by hieroglyphs used as spells. Ooh, in two paintings, the hieroglyphs are represented with formulas to recite. These spoken words were meant to be spells which would allow the deceased to benefit from the offerings for all eternity. Wow, they believed in uh... spells and offerings were also written for the living to enhance medicines and cure illnesses. They believe in a lot of spiritual stuff, eh? Um, they, um, it's interesting because, like, there were a lot of these, like, uh, religious, um, sects. They, uh, they're based off of, like, hallucinogens. So, like, um, the Egyptians were fascinated in death and they would often partake in the blue water lily. Again, another high DMT uh, thing uh, to, to cross over, they'd say, to find out what's going on spiritually. But it's like perspectives, it's like your interpretation is different from mine, you know? So who's right and who's wrong? Did they really see gods or did they see a figment of their imagination? The most famous of ancient Egyptian documents is the Book of the Dead. Yeah, right there. Written in hieroglyphs and hieratic texts, it depicts important spells and rituals. These spells were intended to ensure a smooth transition from life to death and allow the deceased to safely navigate the perils of the afterlife. That's funny if you, uh, that's funny, the Egyptian Book of the Dead. If you read the Tibetan Book of the Dead and you read um, DMT, the spirit molecule, they're essentially describing the exact same experience. Um, light, a feeling like a feeling of oneness, all that stuff. Yeah. Even after it was deciphered, the reading of hieroglyphs remained difficult at times due to the many directions in which they can be read. 
Mm -hmm. Depending on the orientation of the signs, hieroglyphs can be read left to right, right to left, what? horizontally or vertically, though never bottom to top. We need to relax, good sir. That is a lot of configurations. A clue on which way to read is to first notice which direction the figurative signs are facing. If mm. a pictogram is looking to the right, then the reader is meant to start from the right and read towards the figure. Oh, that's interesting. Column text on a papyrus begins from the right, then goes top to bottom for each column. Text written on tomb walls resembles the structure of a page from a comic book. Huh. The text can be placed in front, behind, or above the character, and its symbols look in the same direction as the character. That's funny. Another clue is that the name of a god or hieroglyphs meaning gods or kings are always written before the descriptive text. Hmm. Well, look at this big guy right here. Compared to alphabetical languages, Egyptian hieroglyphs have more symbols. Confronted with the absence of vowels, the Egyptians invented a category of signs. When placed at the end of words, these signs help inform its meaning. Sick. For instance, a drawing of a lion will refer to a lion and also relate to the abstract concept of a lion as something dangerous or powerful. Wow, see, exactly like, like an emoji of poop can be like, oh, you're actually talking about poop or it's a crappy um, experience. Okay. Middle cool. Egyptian hieroglyphs contained a little more than 700 signs. It's a lot. By the end of the Greco Roman period, there were 10,000 signs. Egyptologist Sir Alan Gardner created a list classifying common hieroglyphic signs and their variants. Wow. It's impressive. Ancient Egyptian languages have many similarities with Asian and African languages. They have evolved in similar ways to the various forms of written Egyptian. Huh. These languages belong to the Hamito-Semitic group. There were five clear evolutions in the Egyptian language, each with their own distinctive structure. These languages are known as Old Egyptian, Middle Egyptian, Late Egyptian, Demotic, and Coptic. Coptic is the only living language that allows linguists to define the vowel structure and to distinguish different dialects. That's cool. While hieroglyphs and hieratic script give us an idea as to how the ancient Egyptian language was structured and written, the way it was spoken is still up for debate. The team opted for English as the spoken language with the characters using ancient Egyptian and Greek words and accents. The language that is spoken in the background by the crowds is largely based on Sir Alan Gardner's Egyptian grammar. To help resurrect a dead language, we consulted Egyptologists and dialogue coaches to establish our target sound and cast actors with Arabic, Hebraic, and African backgrounds to bring the game to life. Cool. After Alexander the Great's arrival in Egypt and the establishment of his reign, Greek became the language used by the governing bodies. No way. Makes the sense, inability though. to read hieroglyphs caused resentment among the Greek population. It's from this tension that the Rosetta Stone was created. Okay, please talk about the Rosetta Stone. The spread of Christianity ended pharaonic culture and resulted Sad. in the destruction of its pagan monuments. This also marked the end of hieroglyphic writing and understanding. Oh, didn't talk about the... Alright. Well, yeah. That's cool. It makes sense. Resentment. Because only elite can communicate through this. This is so fascinating. Seems like the Egyptians were, like, highly based on, um... Honestly, psychedelics. Wait, let's see. Do we do a run? Boom. Boom. Yes, we did. Alright, cool. That was a good one. I like that one a lot. So fascinating.
Welcome to Jean-Francois Champollion. Between the 5th century CE and the Renaissance, knowledge of hieroglyphs was entirely lost. Many enthusiasts tackled the challenge of deciphering the language with little success. Hmm. Some groundwork was made with various researchers identifying names and some grammatical structure and confirming that cartouches were markers for royal names. Cool. They were still missing a critical piece of information. Oh, dang. Oh, the Rosetta, hey, Rosetta Stone, Stone was found in 1799 by Bouchard, a soldier in Napoleon's army. The steel updates from 196 BCE, written in ancient Egyptian and Greek with three scripts, hieroglyphics, demotic, and Greek alphabet. Following the defeat of Napoleon Bonaparte in 1801, the English took possession of the stone. It has been at the British Museum since 1802 Sick. and remains the most visited object of the museum to date. Sick. Okay, so it's like um, it's like a thing that allows you to cross-reference meaning. The first translation was of the Greek section only in 1803. It detailed a decree of Pharaoh Ptolemy V, reminding the citizens that their pharaoh had led Egypt to prosperity. It was Propaganda. fully translated 20 years after by Jean-Francois Champollion, who was working with a facsimile. Cool. Oh, entertainer. Through his studies of the stone, Champollion was able to make a critical observation that would unlock the whole mystery. That hieroglyphics were not only ideograms, but also phonograms. Hieroglyphs consist of wow. phonetic glyphs, single characters, and logograms. Essentially, they are a combination of phonetics, alphabet, and full words, which in total form a language. Okay, relax, good sir. You guys are complex. While studying the stone, Champollion realized that there was a difference in the number of hieroglyphic characters in relation to the number of Greek characters for the same word. This led him to believe that hieroglyphs must have phonetic characteristics. Hmm. This was the first step to unlocking the Rosetta Stone's secrets. Interesting. It'd be really, it'd be really cool to understand what uh, the hieroglyphs are saying. Like if you could somehow, like, somebody crack that code. Imagine like the, the, the information contained to within. To prove this theory, Champollion began identifying Egyptian rulers' names and then compared their phonetic pronunciation to the Greek version. For example, Cheops had been the Greek name given by ancient chroniclers to the owner of the Great Pyramid, Khufu. Okay. The next step for Champollion was to confirm that his approach was verifiable by using the Philae obelisk as an additional reference. Engraved in the obelisk are two inscriptions in Egyptian hieroglyphs and Greek. Once he confirmed the names of Ptolemy and Cleopatra within these texts and confirmed the same phonetic patterns as on the Rosetta Stone, Champollion knew he was on the right track. Hmm. Champollion had already mastered several ancient languages when he took on deciphering the Rosetta Stone. He used his knowledge of Coptic to identify the solar disk hieroglyph on the obelisk as the phonetic translation of Ra. Further translation only strengthened his conclusion. Egyptian hieroglyphs encompass the alphabet in both phonetics and determinative ways, which means that the symbol represents the word itself. Hmm, that's pretty cool. Okay, next one. Ooh, the founding of Cyrene. I was wondering where the Rosetta Stone came from. You heard about that back in the early 2000s? It's like a computer program that allows you to learn how to uh, speak multiple languages. Luxury trade was India. Oh, that makes sense, yeah. Along with the sheep. Nice. Sheep's milk over cow's milk. Interesting. It's kind of cool.
Welcome to Cyrene. Oh, that's Cyrene. Cyrene, okay. Oh, that's impressive. Cyrenaica stretches across the coast of northwest Africa. It was known as Pentapolis in antiquity, a reference to the five main cities that formed the Greek colonies. Built on a lush plateau of the Green Mountains, in what is present-day Libya, a colony Ooh. of Greek settlers formed the city of Cyrene in 630 BCE. Libya, wow. Cyrene's population quickly grew, spreading out across the terraces of the plateau, making it the first and largest of the five colonies. Wow, this is... Wow, that's impressive. The city of Cyrene was founded by Batos Aristotle, guided by the Oracle of Delphi. Nice. Overcrowded and suffering from drought, Batos's home island of Thera could not sustain its citizens. Batos consulted the Oracle, who told them to journey to the North African coast in search of arable land. A series of kings reigned over the city in the first two centuries. However, rebellion eventually ended the monarchy, and henceforth, the city was governed by the aristocracy. Hmm, that's cool. Mentioned this before, but I actually checked out the Oracle of Delphi. Again, uh, they're high on fumes. A lot of, um, it's funny how, like, uh, hallucinogens and drugs and stuff are made illegal, but back in the day they used them pretty extensively to make judgment calls and stuff you know it's weird the Who'd key the features of cyrene were temples dedicated to gods apollo makes sense. demeter and zeus alongside ptolemaic gods such as iset and serapis a large agora defined the city center and on the western edge the famed acropolis was built a hmm. fortification wall was added around the harbor at the end of the second century CE. As the city grew, more buildings were constructed beyond the walls. That's cool. Under Roman influence, Cyrene became an economic powerhouse, rising in status throughout the Mediterranean. Cyrene's school of medicine rivaled all others except for that of the Greek city, Kos. Some of the great minds in ancient math, astronomy, and geography were born or established in the various schools of the city, which included an institute of philosophy founded by Aristippus, a pupil of Socrates. Cool. Do we see that um, thing over there? That's the uh, Colosseum. Interesting. Uh, it's funny, uh, it became an economic powerhouse when the Romans took over. Makes sense because the Romans are very capitalist. From 115 to 117 CE, there was a revolt in the Jewish quarter that greatly damaged the city of Cyrene. Over time, a succession of battles, poor management of its silphium crop, and earthquakes eventually took their toll on the city. It was completely abandoned in 365 CE. Hmm. The nearby port of Apollonia was an ideal location, with its natural cove, sheltered by two islands and rocky inlets. Along with a lighthouse, the port was later equipped with keys and warehouses to accommodate the increased shipping traffic. Wow, we're still doing the exact same stuff as back then. It's so funny. Humans don't really evolve. We evolve, but... With its success same, same. as a commercial trading port, Apollonia surpassed Cyrene to eventually become the capital of the Pentapolis. A number of earthquakes gradually shifted the city, causing many of its original structures to sink. Some of its ruins can still be seen underwater. Wow, wow look, there's a theater as well, right there, boom. That's pretty awesome. Huh. Yeah, still doing the same stuff. Egyptians ate while reclining on one elbow. Doesn't seem very uh, digest friendly. Ok, 
Okay, warriors, relax. Welcome to the Agora and Thermal Baths. Okay. Cyrene's Agora was the public marketplace and political hub of the city. Its central courtyard was open to the sky, while market stalls and shops ran along the sides, some neatly tucked away under long roofed colonnades. As in other Greek cities, the Agora included a central hearth, known as a Prytaneum. This place served as Cyrene's official embassy, where guests were welcomed to the city. Oh, that's kind of cool. Um, in Cusco, Peru, they have something similar still. An unnamed statue representing naval victories was the centerpiece of the Agora. The statue's female figure likely represents Nike, the goddess of victory. Hmm. Who's it was Athena? likely very similar to the victory of Samothrace, which currently resides in the Louvre Museum and served as a reference for the team. It's funny how they're all the same kind of thing, just different um, different names. Athena and Nike are the same person, Zeus and Ra. The Cyrene Agora also displayed many temples and monuments, celebrating its founding king, Batos, and the city gods. There were two altars associated with the Temple of Apollo and a marble statue base dedicated to the goddess Libya. Hmm, Libya. The civic buildings included a law court complete with an archive library that would have housed legal documents and other papers essential to the city's governance. Traces of fire damage to the building's remains indicate that it was possibly destroyed during the rebellion of the Jewish community in 115 CE. Holy, they tried to pull a fight club and destroy the, the documents. Public baths were common in Roman and Greek cities, and Cyrene held true to this tradition. Two thermal baths from different eras were discovered among the ruins. An inscription at the entrance of one of the baths is presumed to be attributed to the owner. It dates the building to the Hellenistic period. That's cool. Whoa. Mosaics were originally created for practical reasons. The need to waterproof floors. Imported by Greeks in Egypt and Cyrenaica, the designs represented either scenes from daily life marine fauna, or mythological figures. In addition to traditional Greek motifs, they also integrated concepts specific to Egyptian culture, such as the Nalumbo. The best examples of mosaics recovered to date, however, come from Alexandria. Hmm, fascinating. The Cyrene baths were fitted into an underground tomb dated somewhere between the 8th and 6th century BCE. Bath seats were carved directly in the rock, allowing for more comfortable ablutions. As with many of the public buildings, the thermal baths were elaborately decorated. Statues such as Aphrodite and Eros the Archer were discovered within. Hmm. Eros is the son of Aphrodite, though. The Frigidarium, a pool of cold water, was the first room visitors entered. It was followed by the Tepidarium, or tepid water area. And then the hot water room called the caldarium. Also, it's like which do you want? The water cold? for the thermal baths was sourced from a natural spring. Burning stones were deposited into the water to create steam as required. The flowing water of the spring ended in a cistern and fountain referred to as the Aqua Augusta. That's well, funny because like even today the baths are um, we don't have public baths, so baths are really uh, relaxing can be meditative like who doesn't like to be in the shower like these people knew what was up later Roman baths were built under Emperor Trajan and then restored under Hadrian after the earthquake of 365 CE they were replaced by baths of Byzantine design with stones from the old thermal baths used in the reconstruction the team relied on documentation describing the baths built under Trajan in order to create the location available in the game. Cool. 
That's important. Oh, Temple of Zeus. This is cool. Hmm. Persians are going to take over the world or something? What's going on? Oh, Temple of Zeus. Start tour. Welcome to the Temple of Zeus in Cyrene. Facing east towards the rising sun stands the temple dedicated to the cult of Zeus. The it was cult. built sometime in the 5th century BCE. 70 meters long with 46 Doric style columns. The imposing structure was the largest Greek temple erected in Africa. It was only slightly larger than the Parthenon and the Temple of Zeus in Olympia. Okay. Makes sense. The exterior was designed with the decorative elements common to Doric architecture. The dimensions oh. of the columns were different, giving visitors an impression of uniqueness when viewing each facade. Cool, very cool. After the temple was destroyed during the Jewish rebellion, Emperor Hadrian had it reconstructed. He chose not to rebuild the outer portico, but did restore the new Corinthian columns in marble. The temple they... was later completed under Marcus Aurelius. He's got that ram head. That's cool. In the time of Augustus, a faithful but smaller imitation of the Olympian Zeus was used to be worshipped. Hadrian then installed a new 12 meter high statue matching the Zeus in Olympia. It was made of chiseled marble with the head, arms and feet carved in the round. Archaeologists confirmed that there was a monumental statue of Zeus in this temple Though experts remain divided on whether it was one of Zeus or one more specific to the cult of Zeus Ammon. The team elected to place a statue of Zeus Ammon in this location, knowing that Cyrene was central to the spread of this cult in the Greek Mediterranean area. <laughs> I love how they keep calling it a cult, and that's so funny. But if it had proper, prospered, it would have been a religion. So, what is the difference between a cult and religion belief systems? I think that is where we'll end it for today. That was a nice little short one. It was good. Liked it. We got educated. And uh, yeah, some interesting takeaways. Um, they believe in cults. And it is all based off of uh, some psychedelic enhancements. Till next time. You know. You know what's going on. Take it easy.